Good afternoon. Today's topic is the biosphere, which is a term that describes all of life and the environments that support them. The biosphere intersects with all of the other spheres and cycles that we've been discussing this year. It intersects with the geosphere because plants need soil to survive. It intersects with the hydrosphere because plants need water in order to undergo photosynthesis. And then finally, Every organism uses the atmosphere. We need oxygen to conduct cellular respiration. This video will be split into three parts. We'll first be discussing ecosystems and the different levels of organization within them. We'll then be discussing biomes, which are large regions characterized by their types of plant coverage. And then lastly, we'll be discussing the idea of biodiversity. And why it's important, and what the threats are to it. So to begin, there's many different levels that we can organize a life on. At the lowest level, we have the individual. These are members of a species, which is all of the closely related organisms that can potentially interbreed. Multiple individuals of the same species characterize a population is all members of a single species in a given area. Above that is a community, which summarizes the interactions among species, because it is two or more groups of interacting species with a combination of plants, fungi, and microbes. Above that is the ecosystem. In addition to including living organisms, biotic factors, Ecosystems also include abiotic, non-living factors. For example, the type of soil or temperature, that sort of thing. That includes a particular area. Above that, we have the biome, which is a region with a characteristic plant community. For example, a desert or a tropical rainforest. And then including all of the different biomes and ecosystems is the biosphere, which summarizes all the different global processes. So today we'll talk about ecosystems and then learn about biomes. Next week we'll be talking about population dynamics and how those grow and shrink over time. In an ecosystem, energy is transferred around between organisms. The paths of energy help us to understand how organisms survive and depend on each other. You might already be familiar with the concept of food chains. Grasshoppers eat plants, shrew eat the grasshoppers, snakes eat the shrew, hawks eat the snake. However, food chains do not show the whole picture of energy transfer in an ecosystem. Life is more complicated than that. A single organism can participate in more than one food chain and many organisms eat more than one thing. So a better model for all of these energy pathways is a food web. For example, in the food web on the right, we see the grass and the tree. Well, this food web, it's a bit all over the place and there's a lot of arrows, so it can be a bit confusing. So it often helps to think about it at which trophic level you're at. So on the left, we see all the different producers and decomposers. Those feed the initial primary consumers. So for example, the Pacific tree frog, it will eat some of those plants and flowers available to it. Secondary consumers eat primary consumers, and oftentimes they'll feed on multiple different species. For example, um, the pine marten, will eat the pika, the Pacific tree frog, and the Douglas squirrel, as depicted there. And then at the top, we have tertiary consumers, which will eat all the different layers below it. So I'd like for you to take a moment to stop and think. Why aren't there the same amount of predators as prey in an ecosystem? I'd like for you to imagine a world in which the amount of birds and worms were equal. Why might this not be sustainable? So take a moment, write down a response, and then continue with the video.
One of the key concepts of thermodynamic states that no energy transfer is perfectly efficient. Imagine a car engine that's hot to the touch. Some of the energy from burning gasoline leaves as heat instead of going in order to move the pistons around. In ecology, the same principle applies. The ultimate source of energy for all organisms is the sun. Plants absorb this sunlight and use photosynthesis to create sugars. Consumers then eat the plants or other consumers for their energy. Each step in an energy transfer within an ecosystem is called a trophic level. Troph is the root word for nourish. Organisms use cellular respiration to convert the chemical energy from their food to perform the functions of living, such as producing new cells, regulating their temperature, moving around, things like that. Only about 10% of the energy is actually stored in the organism and available to the next trophic level. The other 90% is lost to heat. This helps us to explain why there are relatively few apex predators in an ecosystem. Well, there are so many plants. Some large predators need to roam over very large areas to hunt enough food to support themselves. Ecosystems are not static. They change over time. Ecosystems emerge first on barren areas, such as new volcanic islands or an area exposed by a retreating glacier, in a process called primary succession. If an already existing ecosystem is decimated by an event, like a fire, that ecosystem could re-emerge in the process of secondary succession. Each of these processes take hundreds or thousands of years to complete. The first plants to move into the area are called pioneer species. These make it more habitable for other species to move in. For example, lichens and mosses are small plants that come in and allow for small animals to live there. As organisms die and erosion weathers rock, a thin soil is formed, which allows for larger plants and thus larger animals to move in. Gradually, over time, a climax community with the largest plants and animals develop. Now the boundary conditions for an ecosystem, the things defining what ecosystems can form in an area, are established by the surrounding climate. Now, you've heard of both weather and climate before. Both of these terms describe the temperature, precipitation, humidity, and the winds going on. But the key difference is the period of time. We ask each other the question, what is the weather today? Or what will it be tomorrow? Whereas the climate, is over an average of decades and not a day-to-day -day phenomenon. There are three main climate zones that depend on latitude. Closest to the equator, within the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, are the tropics. These receive the most solar radiation, so they'll generally have the highest temperatures. Large amounts of evaporation and transpiration in this region usually lead to a lot of precipitation. Above the tropics, but not quite near the Arctic Circle, within 23 degrees and 67 degrees away from the equator, is the temperate region. These have lower temperatures than the tropical zone, and because of the influence of Earth's tilt, these regions will feel the effects of seasons more so than the tropics. Finally, within the Arctic or Antarctic so Circle are polar climate regions. So in the upper parts of Canada and Russia and Greenland and the continent of Antarctica, this is the polar zone. These are going to be the coldest overall regions and they'll have very extreme seasons. To help summarize information about a region's climate, scientists use climatograms. These charts show the key metrics of a region's climate as they change over the year. The month is indicated on the x-axis, so running horizontally, and then two pieces of information are shown on the graph at the same time, rainfall and temperature. Temperature is shown as a line graph, while rainfall is shown as a bar graph. Be sure to pay special attention to the y-axis, 
which tell you the units and range for each of the variables. One major way to classify climates is using the Kirpin climate classification system. This system is based on the concept that native vegetation is the best expression of climate. The boundaries of climate zones have been selected with the vegetation distribution in mind. This system divides the world into five categories and a total of 29 different climates. I'd like for you to take a moment to stop and think. Compare and contrast these two pictures of biomes. What do you think is similar and different about the climate and types of plants and animals that live in each location? So take about 10 seconds, make some observations, write down what you see happening and what you think that implies about the flora and fauna. Once you've finished, then you can move on. So, with these next following slides, I'll go through the different types of biomes. Now, I put the range of temperatures and average rainfall down on each slide. You don't need to write these down. That data is there to help give you some perspective and help you compare the different biomes. We'll first discuss the tropical biomes first, then the temperate biomes, some polar biomes, and then end with the desert. As we go through and learn about the different biomes, keep in mind Jeff Goldblum's famous line from Jurassic Park, life uh, finds a way. In basically all biomes, no matter how extreme, animals and plants have evolved over time, adapting to their environment with a variety of mechanisms to help them survive and reproduce. The main way that we differentiate biomes is depending on their temperature and moisture and which climate zone they're in. Let's talk about the tropical rainforest to begin with. Even though rainforests only cover 7% of the land, they account for at least 40 to 75% of all plant and animal species. Why might this be? Well, their proximity to the equator means that they receive a lot of sunlight without much seasonal variation. Large amounts of rain make these biomes very humid. These factors allow a huge variety of plants to grow all year long. Many plants in the rainforest produce compounds, which are helpful for humans to make medicines. The plant diversity creates many niches, which support a wide variety of animal diversity. And ironically, the soils are pretty poor because all of those plants take all the nutrients from the earth. So they're stored there instead of in the ground. Heavy rains also exacerbate the poor soil by leaching nutrients from the topsoil. Rainforests used to cover 20% of the Earth's surface, but now they only cover 7%. We are losing about one and a half acres per second, mostly due to logging, agriculture, and oil exploration. This habitat destruction threatens not only the animals and plants that live there, but also the indigenous people that call these places home. This endangers our human diversity of cultures and the different ways of living available to us. So it's important to protect these regions and the people and animals that live there. In the tropical savannas, these are grasslands in the tropics that don't get quite as much rain as the rainforests. Most have a distinct wet and dry season. This leads to challenges for life there. Soils are again quite poor but the nutrients get recycled with fires during the dry season. Plants must be able to survive long periods without water, and so they have adapted mechanisms such as wide root systems and narrow leaves. Savannas do not have the biodiversity of rainforests, but they have huge biomass, including lots of very large animals and sometimes large trees. All that food allows for large herds of grazing herbivores, Competition between species is mitigated because they occupy different niches. For example, giraffes eat from tall trees while gazelles graze in the grass, meaning they don't interfere with each other. Tropical savannas are more sensitive to global warming than we previously believed. Savannas are being lost slowly to desertification. In the next 80 years, 6 to 20% of them will disappear 
and threatened mammal species will increase 10 to 40 percent. Normally, warmer climates are less sensitive to global warming than colder climates, though. In temperate forests, the soils are typically very good and rich with organic matter. These are farther away from the equator, and so these ex areas experience more seasonal variation. So there is a wide swing in temperatures from summer to winter. Deciduous trees grow here. That means they drop their leaves in the fall to avoid having freezing water damage their structure in the winter. With a lot of leaves falling, the soil is constantly built up and renewed. In temperate forests, there's potentially large biodiversity and very large biomass. A wide variety of plants and animals can grow very large. Birds migrate in these areas to avoid the harsher winters. They fly toward the equator where more food is available. Other species that can't fly hibernate during the winter, for example, bears. In temperate grasslands, these areas receive moderate precipitation. So many grasses, but not as many trees compared to the forest. These are cooler and less consistent than the savanna. The soils here are typically some of the best on earth. So these areas are used for prime farmland. These areas cover a large portion of earth's surface, the North American prairie, the steppes of Eurasia, and the pampas in South America are all temperate grasslands. They used to cover about 42% of the earth's surface, but because the soil is so good, over 70% of the temperate grasslands are gone due to farming and overgrazing. Grain crops can't anchor the soil as well, so if you grow grain there, a lot of soil is lost to erosion. The next major biome is called the chaparral, which is a rare but interesting biome. It's found in California and the Mediterranean. This term comes from a Basque word, chaparro, meaning evergreen oak shrubland. Interestingly, the Basque people live in northeast Spain and southwest France, which is partially in the chaparral biome. The soils are usually rocky and nutrient poor. They, in this region, there are cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. Conditions are mild and very stable. The lower chaparral may have small trees and shrubs growing. Animals living here have adapted camouflage to help them blend in with the environment, such as this quail depicted here. Higher up in elevation, the chaparral usually gets too little rain to support trees. Now in the polar region is the tundra. These polar grasslands have grasses, but basically no trees. The word tundra comes from the Sami language. This is a group of northern people in this is a group of people living in northern Scandinavia. The word tundra means uplands or treeless mountain tract. The soils here are usually fairly nutrient poor and often frozen. During the short summers, though, the melting ice produces swamp and bog-like conditions, which is an ideal breeding ground for bugs and the birds that feed on them. Tundras are desert-like due to the lack of rainfall. Plants have to have wide, shallow roots and short stems to protect them from the wind and absorb as much heat from the soil as they can. Oil exploration, extraction, and transportation is a major are major threats to the tundra's plants and animals. Spills and leaks of oil can poison their food and water sources. Also in the polar zone is the world's largest biome, the taiga. This word originally comes from Mongolian, meaning untraversable forest. These areas are also known as boreal forests. Evergreen or coniferous trees grow here. These were the first major trees to evolve and have cones for seed pods and don't shed their leaves in winter. Their waxy needles also help to preserve water. Their soils are usually rocky and nutrient poor, and to top it all off, the leaves that fall add a lot of acid to the soil, making it difficult uh, for other plants to grow on the forest floor. Although small lichens do grow, but they're quite spaced out. Despite the small amount of precipitation, Water is available at lakes and swamps, 
which attract aquatic birds to feed on insects and fish there. We'll finish off with the most extreme biome. There are many types of desert, but they're all related in that they don't get much rain at all. And so not much vegetation will grow there. They're often located near mountain ranges, which block moisture-filled clouds. Deserts get less than 25 centimeters, that's 10 inches of rain per year. There's a little chemical weathering and soils take a long time to develop here. So they are usually rocky, and have lots of salts in them, which are toxic to many plants. Tropical deserts are some of the hottest places on Earth. The sun can heat up the land, but there is very little water vapor, so there are lots of cold nights. With global warming, these desert areas may grow, but melting ice, cal melting ice caps could affect rain patterns. Life has to fight to survive and has adapted. Some animals that live here never actually drink liquid water. Deserts can also be cold, as long as they still don't receive as much rain. The largest desert on Earth is actually in Antarctica. Here in North Carolina, although we're overall in the temperate deciduous forest region, we have several different sub-regions, depending on where we are in the state. Along the eastern part of the state near the coast, Flat topography, warm temperatures, high rainfall, and rich soil make this region great farmland. In the center of the state where we live, this is called the Piedmont, which is French for rolling foothills. If you've dug in the dirt before, you're quite familiar with our red soil, characterized by its high clay content. And then finally, in the western part of the state are the Appalachian Mountains. These ancient mountains used to be quite tall, although they have been worn away by erosion over time. As we have seen, there is an amazing variety of places where organisms live. Accordingly, there is a huge number and variety of species across the world. Scientists use the term biodiversity, short for biological diversity, to describe the number and variety of different species in a particular area. As we discussed already, Rainforests are a hot spot for diversity. On the other hand, a big expansive field of wheat would have a much lower biodiversity. Compare these two forests on the right side, which looks like it has a higher biodiversity. While both have the same number of trees, the distribution of their types is more varied in the top case. So, why is biodiversity important? Well, because ecosystems are these interdependent networks of interaction, having a variety of species fulfilling different roles makes them more resilient towards a disruption. So when one species disappears, a strand of the food web is removed, and the whole knot could unravel. Biodiversity helps to protect against this. In order for populations to survive disruptions from their environment, they must have a variety of genes available so that they are ready to adapt to new changes. Genetic variation increases the likelihood that some individuals would survive environmental pressures and reproduce. Industrial agriculture has a problem with this. For example, bananas are all genetic clones of each other, and as such have very low variation. They are more susceptible to disease as a consequence as there are very few, if any, individual trees with resistance to some diseases. Humans also use a variety of plants and animals for food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. About a quarter of the drugs prescribed in the U.S. are derived from plants. Many plants and animals are also beautiful, and people enjoy looking at them. Biodiversity helps our recreation. We do activities such as camping or bird watching. Finally, Besides ecosystem and population resilience, or utility, biodiversity is important in and of itself, for the simple reason that other animals and plants have a right to exist, regardless of their value to us. However, there are numerous threats to biodiversity. I'd like you to think about what human activities you think could impact biodiversity and take a moment to explain why these activities might be problematic.
The loss of habitats has caused 75% of the extinctions now occurring. Developing land for housing and resources destroys and fragments other species' habitats. For example, as we said before, predators need large tracts of land to roam, but when their area is broken up by, say, a highway, they can't hunt as effectively. So the ecosystem won't be able to support as many predators. Harvesting and hunting too much can also lead to extinction. For example, white settlers in the 1800s nearly hunted the buffalo to extinction. As such, countries have laws which regulate how many animals can be hunted, fished, or traded. However, sometimes these activities continue in the crime of poaching. As a consequence of industrialization, pesticides, cleaning agents, drugs, and other chemicals produced by humans have made their way into the food web. Their immediate effects may not be readily apparent. For example, Rachel Carson, in her famous book, Silent Spring, wrote about the effects of the pesticide DDT, which farmers used prolifically on their crops and people applied it as a bug spray. The DDT becomes concentrated at higher trophic levels since the consumers cannot cleanse it from their system when they eat the plants that it's put on. Over time, this causes apex predators like the bald eagle to become endangered. DDT weakened the integrity of their eggshells, making it harder for them to reproduce. With the fallout from the book, DDT is now illegal to use in the US, although we still manufacture it and ship it abroad. Another major threat to biodiversity is the introduction of invasive species. These are plants, animals, or other organisms that are introduced to a given area outside of their original range and can cause harm in their new home. No local predators exist, so they can spread rapidly and proliferate. Some are introduced intentionally, like kudzu, depicted down below, for erosion control. But it grew well in the humid southeast and smothered other plants, cutting off their sunlight. At the top, the European starling is an interesting case, because some Americans were fans of Shakespeare and wanted to introduce all of the birds mentioned in his works to America. They imported about 60 starlings in the late 1800s, released them into the wild, and their population now numbers 150 million. Some invasive species are introduced accidentally. For example, the stink bug, originally from China, it has become an agricultural pest here. Fire ants, originally native to South America, have also displaced many native species of ants. If biodiversity is not protected, we could find ourselves on the path to another mass extinction. Over time, there have been several mass extinctions throughout history. You'll likely be familiar with the one that killed off the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Unfortunately now, humans have caused their own mass extinction. With the acceleration of colonialism and industrialization, the rate of extinction has increased by a factor of 50 since 1800. A threatened species has a declining population. Endangered means that they are likely to become extinct if we don't do something soon, and extinct means that species is gone forever. John James Audubon drew these pictures of birds in the early 1800s. They are now all currently extinct. The bottom is the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is critically endangered, but it's probably extinct. The last official sighting was in 1944. The middle picture shows the Carolina parakeet, which actually used to live in our area. It was declared extinct in 1939. The last case is the most interesting and tragic. Usually, we think of species with the smallest population living in small areas to be the most susceptible to extinction, like the dodo. However, the passenger pigeon in the upper right corner used to be the most numerous bird in the United States, with a population of 3 to 5 billion. It could also fly about 60 miles per hour. To put this into perspective, Audubon tells the story of encountering a massive migration of them. And I quote here, the air was literally filled with pigeons. 
the light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse, end quote. He traveled for three days, and the whole time the sky was filled with pigeons. Less than a hundred years later, the passenger pigeon was extinct. What happened? Hunting and deforestation on an industrial scale destroying their habitats and reducing their numbers below the critical value to reproduce caused a steep decline in their population in the late 1800s. The last died in captivity in the early 1900s. Sorry to end on such a sad note. Keep these stories in mind when you consider the impacts of human activity. Next time, we'll be discussing population dynamics. Have a good day.